We're only seven minutes late, and I'm the first to go. My name is Joseph Joffe. I'm one of the um, one of the trustees, and I've known Gerhard since I first came to Stanford in 1999. So uh, we've been around for a while. So obviously, it's an absolute pleasure for me to introduce Gerhard Casper. Of course, it is a micro. Where is the Where are the technicians? One, two, three, four, better? Come and sit here. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure for me to introduce Gerhard Casper along with a new crop of, of fellows. The best we ever had, at least until the next class comes in. So to you, to the fellows, welcome to the Wannsee. Be, it, be productive, but also enjoy Berlin and one another. Now, as you know, Gerhard is our new chairman and president, uh, sorry, president and executive director, and I can only say what a catch. As you know, it has been quite a journey to find a replacement for Gary Smith, who's sitting there, without whom this academy would never, ever have reached its exalted place in the world of the mind across the Atlantic. So, three cheers for Gary. <laughs> so, if, you're look, if you were looking for a worthy, for what the one per perfect candidate to succeed him, it would be and is Gerhard Casper. Um, it wasn't easy. Now, see, consider why not. Consider the many disparate talents the head of the American Academy has to unite in one, in one person. I count at least seven. First, he has to know American academia. Second, he has to know German and European academia. He has to know the culture and the politics on either side of the ocean. Four, he has to be a schmoozer extraordinaire. You guys know what a schmoozer is? <laughs> yes. Um, and he has to schmooze in at least two languages, German and English. He has to run a multi-million dollar institution, and he has to tame, seventh, he has to tame board members, a, bo a board whose members, like me, know everything better. <laughs> All of us on the board are specialists in second guessing. So we reached for the stars, and we got Gerhard Casper, a hamburger turned American, a top-notch constitutional scholar with a distinguished career at Yale and Chicago, and a man who, ra who ended up running the finest university in the universe. <laughs> at, Harvard, at Harvard, where I come from, we now call Stanford Nunn, N-O-N-E, as in as in Harvard is second to none. <laughs> <laughs> so why did Stanford snatch Gerhard from Chicago, where he served as dean of the law school as provost and was well on the way to becoming the president of Chicago? One of his colleagues there was quoted, I don't know his <laughs> name, it's, 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 quote, because like Jesus, he can walk on water. <laughs> this is not the whole truth. Garrett has been walking on water only because he can't swim. <laughs> the second reason why Stanford took him is that he was the only man in America, at least in academic America, who could correctly pronounce Stanford's German motto, Die Luft der Freiheit weht. But pulling on Jesus and mastering correct German pronunciation are just two of his outstanding qualities. Thir so third and particularly high on my personal list is Gareth's wisdom. To begin, he is one of America's greatest constitutional scholars, but there's more. Hailing from Europe, which has torn up scores of constitutions in the last two centuries, he developed a strong respect, and I would even say, a indeed admiration for the U.S. Constitution, and why not? 
It's 220 year, years old and still going strong, as strong as Johnny Walker. <laughs> and the document in my book is, is, is a legal as well as a creedal document embodying the civil religion of uh, the Western liberal state. So you go tap when you th later on when you want to touch his sleeve and everything, tap his, tap his breast. And there in this pocket, there's a well-thumbed American constitution, which he carries around at all time. Uh, <laughs> you see, would I lie to you? No. So after eight years at Stanford, two terms, he invoked the 22nd Amendment, which limits presidential tenure to two terms. And why did he do so? His very simple answer, I, I'll quote him, if eight years is good enough for a US president, it's good enough for me. Thus speaks a man who knows his place in the world right behind the American president. Yet such wisdom has its price. When his wish to resign from the presidency uh, at Stanford became public, a bunch of students invaded Hoover House, which is the official residence of Stanford presidents. So tearfully, they pleaded with him to reconsider. But as gratified and touched as he was, he didn't. Afterwards, though, one of the students declared that the mission had still been a success by saying, I just did not want him to think it was a thankless job. The campus agreed, and the thanks came to Gerhard came and stayed. At his last commencement, he was greeted by a stadium full of students chanting, Gerhard, Gerhard. Typically, our humble hamburger responded with his own way of saying thanks. Quote, thank you for reminding me of my name. <laughs> <laughs> Which commencement speaker, just to be safe, commencement speaker then Kofi Annan, the UN Secretary General, did as well when he started his address, commencement address, with Gerhard, Gerhard. <laughs> so all the world knows his name. What else might justify such accolades of affection and respect? Here's just one modest reason. Because he turned a great regional university into one which some rankings around the world now classify as number one and how did he do it? Easy it was not. I won't give you the whole story. I'll just quote Stanford Magazine, which recalls that moment when he started. Quote, when he arrived, Stanford was reeling from three separate seismic shocks. One was a real one, the great earthquake, uh, which devastated not only the Bay Bridge, you may remember having seen the pictures, but also the campus. Two, a national recession. Three, as the magazine puts it very subtly, quote, allegations that the university overcharged the federal government for research costs, unquote. These quote, unquote, allegations had led to the resignation of Gerhard's successor. The list of Gerhard's achievements would take the whole evening undoubtedly to read, and I won't, and I won't do it because there are lots of other things happening. Uh, let me just highlight one. During his tenure, he raised $2.2 billion. And this long before we, uh, <coughs> we started, we, we stopped talking about billions and started juggling with trillions after the great crash. Um, the money didn't just, and this is the important thing, didn't just go into new buildings but also into the re revamping of undergraduate student education and especially the liberal arts. And this um, is quite apropos for us here. People think that Stanford is just a high-class techie school. In fact, unlike MIT and Caltech, um, it is world-renowned for its humanity and social, sci uh, 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 social sciences, and not the least because of Gerhard Kasper. So 
If you are Gerhard Kasper, where, where would you go after Stanford? I mean, university which rose pr to, preem to preeminence in his, during his two terms, well, the answer is obvious. It's right before you. You go to the American Academy. In terms of excellence, the American Academy is just one or two steps behind Stanford <laughs> and catching up. There's just a tiny little difference. Stanford's annual budget is as big as all of Bavaria's 10 state universities together. So in, s in terms of funding, not, but not of excellence, in terms of funding, the American Academy is still a way to go. But fear not, a man who can raise $2 billion for Stanford will soon amass $2 billion for the American <laughs> Academy. <laughs> after all, after all, <laughs> shh, after all, his Chicago colleague, as I quoted him before, Gerhard can walk on water. We will start with the Wannsee and then move from there. <laughs> Am I hyping him? Then let me read, be, be before you kill this, let, let me read from the Stanford Weekly. Quote, few people would have predicted the rosy end of the century glow at Stanford when Casper took office in 1992, unquote. So in our future, I see vast buildings. I see Wimbledon type tennis courts, <laughs> swimming pools, and a golf course all of which already exists at Stanford. Plus, of course, rich people, as, in, as they do at Stanford, clamoring, please, American Academy, take our money. <laughs> there are just two things that can, could, could break this benign spell. One is never, ever call him Jerry. If so, <laughs> he will take the next plane back to San Francisco. And don't go overboard on the expectations I've just ra raised. Not even Gerhard, the man who can walk on water, can bring Stanford's palm trees to cold and rainy Berlin. <laughs> but everything else I said is the gospel truth. You can't hype hamburgers, nor will I let you. Gushing is as uncool for, for a true hamburger as accepting a Medal of Merit from the government. So this man is everything I said, and much, much more, as you will soon see when he takes over. Gerhard, you make us proud, and we are proud to welcome you. Did you do me a favor? Distinctly no, distinctly no. I will never recover from this introduction. Uh, <laughs> Terrible, terrible. I hope the amplification did not work in that room, uh, <laughs> uh, because then you would have been spared these exaggerations. Uh, thank you, thank you, Joe. It, it is a true pleasure uh, uh, to be here and to be here on the Fellows uh, 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 Night. Uh, I apologized earlier to them because to some extent uh, we are hijacking it uh, uh, to have uh, this opportunity to introduce me to the friends of the Academy, of whom many are here, and I'm immensely grateful uh, for that. Uh, now, I will also acknowledge the presence of Gary, uh, but only his presence and no more. <laughs> uh, Gary, uh, who left his office on December 31, had the most extravagant series of farewell parties that I have ever been able uh, to learn about. I, thank God, was sitting in California and couldn't come near them. Uh, so uh, I will not add to it, but, but look, he survived. Not only that, he looks pretty healthy, and that is very welcome, and we hope to see a lot of you in the future, uh, uh, Gary. Um, Wikipedia alleges that there are 14,000 Americans living in Berlin. That's not a very large number. Uh, I mean, given the population of Berlin, not a very large number, but large enough certainly not to take notice of any additional American like myself 
uh, uh, coming here and spending time here. But Joe already alluded to the fact uh, that this is not any old American, but an American from Hamburg, the free and Hanseatic city of Hamburg. And I should tell you that when I was five or six years old, there was a custom around St. Martin's Day, uh, which is November 11. I think actually the custom still exists in German cities where uh, children would process through the streets with paper lanterns. And uh, we were singing songs. And I remember distinctly singing Hamburg, Lübeck, Bremen, die brauchen sich nicht zu schämen, <laughs> denn sie sind eine freie Stadt, wo Bismarck nichts zu sagen hat. For those of you who don't speak German, Hamburg, Lübeck, and Bremen need not to be ashamed because they are free cities where Bismarck has no say. So you understand that I from, and, and by the way, I, uh, I will not uh, turn this into an act of protest against the Nazis, but we did see th sing this song in 1944 or 1943, and it had political implications probably Bismarck standing for another ruler in Berlin. Uh, but uh, uh, I grew up, obviously, uh, with a very, very skeptical view of Prussia and anything it stands for. Now, I have one saving grace, as Joe and Christine and others who know me know. I married a Berliner and uh, 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 have, therefore, been able to adjust my incorrect views about Berlin <laughs> uh, uh, for 50 years of marriage now. Uh, so uh, here we are. Uh, my life has been uh, uh, the university. And when I told friends that I was coming uh, to the American Academy, uh, some found that surprising. But it is not. One aspect of having been a prizing, uh, uh, one aspect of universities I have been prizing ever since Berkeley and Chicago and then of course in Stanford is interdisciplinariness and interdisciplinary work. And uh, the academy is interdisciplinarity incarnate with the great advantage that there are no physical distances to overcome. Uh, as there would be at Yale or on the large Stanford uh, campus. Uh, so this is something that for me is natural and I lo just love uh, coming and being here. My great regret is I have read all the biographies of you this year's fellows and uh, I will of course be taken, off by, uh, taken away by an airplane three days from now and will not have the pleasure of Un, uh, of meeting you or getting to know you, unless you prolong your stay for another half year, uh, then we could meet and that would be very welcome as far as I'm concerned. While being a center for advanced uh, study is one of the missions of the academy, the other mission is uh, to work on US-German, uh, US-European relations. And uh, I am really very, very pleased that at the end of a long, towards the end, no, not the end, I'm not entering the eternal hunting grounds uh, quite as yet, uh, but towards the end of a long professional life uh, that, uh, that was focused on the one hand on American constitutional law and American constitutional history, and on the other hand on American university and some of the most wonderful institutions among them, uh, uh, I will now be able to make some modest contribution to uh, uh, German-American relations, and I'm very much looking forward to that. The deputy chief of mission will report that back to his boss. <laughs> uh, now, my main task tonight is not to say any of the things I just said, but to introduce Lorraine Daston. I have known Lorraine Daston and her husband, Gerd Gigerenzer, since the early 90s. I was then the provost at the University of Chicago, 
we at Chicago wanted both of them very much. Lorraine as professor of history and the history of science, and Geert as a professor of psychology. Probably among the most challenging tasks a provost faces is that of recruiting a couple. There is no question that I acquitted myself successfully, very successfully. But then I did something rather dastardly. As they were coming to Chicago in 1992, I left unpredictably after 26 years at the university for Stanford. Alas, I cannot claim that their departure from Chicago in 1995 had anything to do with their disappointment in me. <laughs> Quite to the contrary, it was Berlin that beckoned. For Lorraine, the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, for Geert, the Max Planck Institute for Human Development. They are what you might call, and I apologize beforehand because I have never until tonight ever used this expression. They are what you might call an American-German academic power couple. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, <laughs> Lorraine from Michigan, mostly Harvard educated, <coughs> second to none indeed. Thank you. I, I will now have to introduce this new uh, usage at Stanford calling us none. Uh, <laughs> very intriguing. Uh, and Geert from Bavaria and the University of Munich. Since Lorraine is going to speak for only 15 minutes, I'm obviously not permitted to spend more than that to introduce her. Though I could, easily. Suffice it, suffice it to say that she is one of the most distinguished historians of science in the world. Historian of science does not quite capture it. She is interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity in one person. As one of my Stanford colleagues recently wrote, Daston's scholarship reflects a remarkable range of interests and erudition extending across chronological and national boundaries, including evidence from art and literature, philosophy and theology, as well as scientific theory and practice. Jim Sheehan did not mention poetry, though in a recent interview, Rainey said she reads lots of it, both old and new, and delights in almost all of it. Her absolute favorite displays, displays her exquisite taste, somewhat exotic, at least for me, because he is George Herbert, the 17th century English poet who uh, lived in Bremerton near Salisbury in his rectory. And I told uh, 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 Rainey before uh, we got here uh, that I indeed had the privilege of staying at the rectory recently because a friend of mine bought it. And, uh, <laughs> and because of his admiration for George Herbert. So I now know, pe now know two people who have this rather out of the ordinary taste, uh, uh, George Herbert, and Rainey is not the least of them. Rainey. Gerhard, thank you. That was hyperbolic, but very kindly hyperbolic. Um, it is at once a privilege and a provocation to introduce the city of Berlin to the incoming fellows of the American Academy. The privilege emanates from you, um, the fellows, a constellation of stars of the first magnitude in scholarship, journalism, and the arts. This evening, we all bask in your reflected light. The provocation comes from me, for who am I, an American resident of the city for a dozen or so years, neither a Berliner born nor a Berliner designated to speak for this city? Yet such is the magnetism of Berlin that many thousands, 14,000 we heard just now, of American non-Berliners are drawn to the city each year and against all councils of prudence and also councils of ease, Berlin is not an easy city, they decide to stay. And I'm not only talking about the emigres from Brooklyn and from Bucharest, but also from Tübingen and Munich. From the standpoint of the native Berliners, 
people from Swabia and Bavaria are at least as foreign as those from New York and Tel Aviv. My task in this, yes, more. I've never seen, <laughs> I've never seen in Kreuzberg New Yorkers raus. I have seen Schwaben raus. <laughs> My task in this very brief introduction, and I promise you it will be brief, the main attraction this evening are the fellows, is to try to explain this mysterious Berlin magnetism. So, as Gerhard just told us, I came to Berlin from the University of Chicago, and I confess I did not come with an entirely willing heart. And it wasn't just the fact that we lost our brilliant debonair provost. I loved the skyscraper sublimity of Chicago the city, and I loved the argumentative intensity of Chicago the university. I had before spent a year in West Berlin as a fellow of the Wissenschaftskolleg, um, but that was before the wall came down. Um, the sedate soirees of the Grunewald in the 1980s were light years away from the gritty realities of East Berlin where I and my colleagues were supposed more or less ex nihilo to create a new research institute in the history of science. So we found temporary accommodations um, in East Berlin. Um, it was, that was just after um, the Czech Republic and Slovakia had split and the embassy was looking for subletters. So we became the new Slovakia. Um, this, this, is, this was a building that is, it's still there, um, on the corner of Wilhelmstrasse and Mohrenstrasse, and as the ambassador of the Czech Republic then told me, it is a sterling example of socialist brutalism. I can only say, jawohl. Um, so it had a prime location, it was just a stone's throw away from the Brandenburg Gate, but even compared to leafy, sleepy Grunewald, that part of the city, the very center of Mitte, seemed like a ghost town in 1995. There were no cars and hardly any pedestrians. At noon on a weekday, you could hear your footfalls echo in the empty streets. There was only one restaurant on Unter den Linden, a very badly lit Italian place <laughs> that we suspected of being a mafia outpost because we were only the only customers. There were vacant lots full of wildlife and weeds in between the architectural remains of East German, indeed, Third Reich officialdom. I remember walking down Wilhelmstrasse one morning, encountering a fox marching down Wilhelmstrasse, <laughs> its tail aloft like the plume of a drum major's helmet, bold as brass, as if he owned the place, which indeed he did. If you've visited that part of town already, which probably most of you have, you know that nowadays it's thronged with tourists. It's buzzing with commerce and cafes. It's glittering with new buildings, embassies, department stores, opera houses, offices, museums. There is nary a fox nor a parking space to be found. Whatever one thinks of this transformation, it is undeniably a transformation. Berlin is a shapeshifter. And everywhere you look, every time you look, something is being transformed into something else. Everything is being perpetually repaired or remodeled or rethought, as in the never-ending debate over what to do with the site of the former Palace der Republik of East Germany, which in turn was built on the site of the former palace of the Hohenzollern royal family of Prussia. There were a lot of formers in that part of town. This has its inconvenient side. The city is pockmarked with construction sites, and I fear that the new fellows have probably already encountered the work that's being done on the S-Bahn that connects Wannsee with Mitte. I warned you that Berlin was not an easy city. But it's also part of the city's magnetism. Most European capitals have been laminated. Their city-states and their histories literally set in stone and jealously preserved by laws of patrimony and heritage not Berlin. Berlin is a city that Ovid would have loved, a city of metamorphoses. All of this building activity might give you the impression that the economy is booming in Berlin. <laughs> Alas, <laughs> this is not the case. This city is dirt poor. It's got a debt the size of Venezuela's. 
Berlin was once a manufacturing city, a city of big shoulders, Chicago on der Spree. But the destruction of the war and the economic isolation of both parts of the city thereafter led to a habit of living off of subsidies in both the East and the West. First, from the United States and the Soviet Union, for whom Berlin was in the Cold War a showcase of rival political systems. And after reunification from the federal German government, and as I never fail to hear from my husband, from Bavaria. <laughs> What Berlin produces these days are symbols in the form of science, scholarship, music, art, literature, film, and also in the form of history, endlessly debated, endlessly memorialized. Every street name, every street cobblestone is a potential occasion for remembering or pointedly forgetting someone or something. Neighbors battle sometimes for years as to whether they are living on Karl Marx Allee or Konrad Adenauer Straße. <laughs> and over whose version of history should be inscribed in the plaques, monuments, and even the tiny Stolpersteine, the stumbling blocks that are in inlaid into the Berlin sidewalks to remember those persecuted, deported, or murdered by the National Socialists. At least for a historian like myself, this unrelenting awareness of, one might even say, haunting by history is also part of its magnetism. Much of Berlin's extravagant economy of symbols is the legacy of Cold War competition. So forbidden by both their Soviet and their American minders to compete in the military sphere, they'd done that twice, it hadn't worked out, um, East and West Berlin competed culturally with universities, museums, orchestras, operas, corps de ballet. As a result, when the city was reunited in the 1990s, Berlin had an embarras de richesse that it has, in splendid defiance of common sense, and it's perpetually in the red budget, refused to consolidate. So in addition to three opera houses, actually four, counting the experimental house in Neukölln, three universities, Berlin has 73 extra university research institutes, of which mine is only one, 84 libraries, including the two magnificent Staatsbibliotheken, Stabi Ost und West, and 195 museums. Now, just for a moment to contrast the real and the symbolic economies, this is a city with over 10% unemployment and 200 museums with more on the way. Symbols matter more than matter in Berlin. Berlin also has about a thousand cafes. No one knows the precise number. Even as I speak, probably some bright young thing in Moabit or Friedrichshain is setting out chairs on the sidewalk, brewing rocket fuel strength coffee and thinking up an enticing name. Let's say romantically that Berlin has a thousand and one cafes, like the a thousand and one Arabian Nights. Not that Berlin cafes are romantic. We are not in Vienna. <laughs> Do not expect confectionery masterpieces, Murano chandeliers, and dapper waitstaff. Indeed, do not expect the waitstaff at all. <laughs> Once you've eventually, after a seemly and dignified interval, been served your espresso, you'll be left unmolested for hours on end. No one will officiously bring you your bill unsummoned or pointedly ask whether you'd like to order anything else. Berlin cafes are full of people who are nursing their one cappuccino as they skim the newspaper, check their email, probably dicto read a book for half a day. Now, it is true that chains like Starbucks have arrived in the more touristy parts of the city, bringing their grab a coffee and dash rhythms. But the tempo in a real Berliner cafe is andante, maybe even legato. Time, so rare and precious, seems plentiful here. The sign of a real Berlin cafe is that they are still serving breakfast at 4 p.m. <laughs> it is probably romantic of me to imagine that the person at the next table is writing the next great novel 
composing the next great opera, although perhaps he or she is writing the next great dissertation. There are 170,000 students in the city. But there is something intrinsically romantic, even in Heart of Ebony Berlin, about an abundance of time and the sense of possibility that comes with it. Now, I know that by the normal calendar, um, your time, the time of the fellows, in Berlin must seem very brief. And I have two pieces of advice for you. Lose your calendar and buy a Bayfell gay card. Um, a Monat card will allow you to use the whole public transportation network at a whim, and I do mean a whim. Succumb to the magnetism of Berlin. To the liberating thought that time is at your disposal, even if in your heart of hearts you know that it is a mirage. Venture out into the city, not just its trendier parts, but also its grittier ones. Find a nice cafe that's still serving breakfast as the sun disappears in the west on a short winter day. Pretend that you can reinvent yourself in the way that the city around you is doing. Pretend that the symbols that you're creating in your time here will matter. Pretend you have all the time in the world. I'm looking forward to hearing what you're gonna do with it. <laughs> Lorraine, thank you for those great words of advice. I have my Bayfell, Bay Bay, uh, BBG card, my German is done, and yes, I will use it. Um, I wanna thank uh, the board. I wanna thank the supporters of the Academy, a lot of whom are here tonight. It's wonderful staff, and of course, Gary Smith and Gerhard Casper. We're falling between two stools here, but thanks, because without you, this would not be possible. I'd also like to thank the selection committee whose um, astute judgment made it possible for me to stand here tonight as the Holtzbrink Fellow. And also for me to, uh, who orchestrated this wonderful class of fellows. It's a joy really to be in their midst. Some of you may have seen The Atlantic this week, and if so, you might have uh, seen the blistering critique of all things algorithmic penned by Ian Bogost. How timely, given the topic of my research. Uh, Bogost writes, here's an exercise. The next time you see someone talking about algorithms, replace the term with God and ask yourself if the sense changes any. I've spent a lot of my academic career looking at the intersection of history, philosophy, and technology, that is to say, at media. And I've especially explored beginnings of various media systems, printing press, photography, television here in Berlin in the 30s. Looking at the emergence of cultural practices that draw upon and structure technology. Alas, Manichaean react reductions of the kind that uh, Bogost's article spells out are far too familiar. And probably they say something about our reflexes as a culture, that kind of anxiety, that kind of fear. Let me assure you that my work is not about the worship of algorithms, nor is it a diatribe against them. But in an era of intensive digitization and ever-growing processing power, algorithms are more than just the regular kind of tool that has a good purpose or a bad purpose. Actually, there are tools with a difference. Algorithms, what are they? Algorithms are simply programs, formulas, into which we can plug different values. Last year, a company called Narrative Science used these little programs to write over one and a half million articles for American newspapers. OkCupid okay matched millions of happy or perhaps unhappy couples. Facebook used algorithms to decide which of your friends' comments you would see. The NSA deployed them to sieve mind-boggling amounts of data. Spotify and Pandora called upon Echo Nest's algorithms to predict the musical tastes of their customers. God, algorithms are predicated on the materialities of labor, both creative labor and plain old hard work, on electricity, computers, and silicon. They're built from these things, they stand on these things, and in a certain sense, it's the latest layer of a series of technologies, and so they stand out for our attention. My research puts algorithms into a particular perspective, one that offers a sharp contrast 
with the project of the long mar modern, a project we can trace back to the 15th century with Alberti and Gutenberg. A long modern summed up in Heidegger's notion of the world picture, Das Weltbild. Heidegger says, the world picture is not a picture of the world, but the world conceived and grasped as picture. The world picture does not change from an earlier medieval one into a modern one, but rather the fact that the world becomes a picture at all is what distinguishes the essence of the modern age. Bound up in Heidegger's world picture are characteristics that we've long taken for granted, even celebrated in our institutions and academic protocols. The stable text, attribution and authorship, the fixed point of view, the all-defining self, the subject-object binary, man the measure. And these are the very characteristics now under siege, now subject to change as algorithms in an era of ever advancing connectivity and com computation enable a synthesis and a blurring of points of view as they diffuse attribution, erode individual authorship through collaborative production, and render texts anything but stable. If we think of the critiques, I mean, think of the critiques meted out against Wikipedia, for example. Unstable, who wrote it, how can we trust it? Or consider the assaults on the sanctity of the self that we feel with predictive algorithms. They know too much what's happening to our privacy. My project considers the reconfiguration of cultural production, of participatory potentials and their ethical frameworks, of notions of labor and the economic logics enabled by algorithms. Most importantly, it positions algorithms as intermediaries of sort, standing between the subject and the object, standing, um, enabling a redefinition of a subject and stepping out of the world picture. That is, and, this, and this move, this step, is at once precarious, unsettling, and ripe with potential. The rapid development of self-optimizing algorithms, algorithms that repair themselves, that improve themselves without human intervention, the increasing development of our most basic cultural uh, activities, their infusion with algorithms, and the fundamental disruption of the project of the modern suggest that we need to think about what's outside the frame, what comes after the modern. And I think if we look at the work of algorithms, that's, that's the space we're gonna see what's coming next. So thank you. Good evening. I'm honored to be the Nina Maria Gorison Fellow of History, and as such, I'd like to thank the American Academy in Berlin and everyone here for the opportunity to be back in Berlin and the very warm reception. Um, and thank you, Professor Zastin, for the Ovidian welcome to Berlin. Every scholar, every project needs a muse. Thanks to Groucho Marx and a recent conversation with Tom Drury, I found one for my project Encyclopedic Kinds in the late Renaissance. I'm thinking of Groucho's version of the 1939 song, Lydia the Tattooed Lady, which he sings at the circus, in At the Circus. Part of the song goes, Lydia, oh Lydia, say have you met Lydia, Lydia the Tattooed Lady. Lydia, oh Lydia, that encyclopedia. <laughs> oh, Lydia, the queen of tattoos. On her back is the Battle of Waterloo, beside it the wreck of Hesperus too, and proudly above the waves, the red, right, white, and blue, you can learn a lot from Lydia. Lydia, we learn here in the, and in the other verses that describe her different tattooed body parts, is a living, laughing encyclopedia. She embodies everything worth knowing, at least according to Groucho. In this, she may be said to symbolize the two kinds of Renaissance encyclopedism I study in my project. For such encyclopedism meant either an individual striving to complete the circle of learning, to master the liberal arts, or it signaled the ambition to construct a single physical book that would contain all there was to know about a particular subject, or in many instances, many instances, all subjects. In short, as the always proliferating, now orderly, now disorderly genres or kinds of late Renaissance 
encyclopedic writing confirm, encyclopedism from the 15th through the 17th centuries was both an intellectual ideal and increasingly a material, readable object. So I'm, de I'm dedicating my time here at the Academy to researching, interpreting, diagramming, mapping, if you will, texts that show the range of encyclopedic genres. These include Rabelais, Gargantua, and Pancho Burel, and Johann Fischart's translation of the same, both of which are fueled by myriad, seemingly inexhaustible lists, what Hegel calls a bad infinity, if you will. For, uh, Fernandez, uh, Francisco Hernandez, New World Natural History, which is converted a generation later by the Academy of the Lynxide in Rome into phytosophical tables and the first collaborative encyclopedia. Commentaries on Ovid and Garcilaso, which are heavily informed by Pliny's natural history. Real and imagined libraries, museums, and wunderkammern, such as Gian Battista Marino's lyric notional gallery of pictures. Munster's Cosmographia, a massive discursive and visual atlas. Bacon's progressive utopian plans for a great restoration. Burton's humanist skeptical, this is another list of bad infinities. <laughs> Bacon's humanist skeptical, endlessly digressive anatomy of melancholy. And Athanasius Kircher's hermetic antiquarian two volume Egyptian Oedipus, which would intuit the originary one in the language and myriad particulars of ancient Egypt. Given these texts, given this list, my main thesis is that these various, often competing genres are fluid, labile enough to fuel discoveries of new ideas and ways of seeing. That through them, encyclopedism becomes progressive, heuristic, as well as serving to conserve what is already known. Encyclopedi encyclopedic writing, in other words, may cultivate invention and memory. It may aspire alternately to mystical truths or result in ironic self-consciousness. And if the texts and objects I consider all try and all fail to close the circle of learning, yet as material artifacts, they continue to compel close and distant reading. With this said, in order to retain my sanity and avoid the pathos and folly endemic to most encyclopedic writing, my perspective atlas of encyclopedic writing does not aim to be exhaustive. Instead, I aim to construct a sequence of macrocosmic and microcosmic perspectives on an intellectual historical literary phenomenon at the heart of Western and other cultures. One that in part, because by definition it can never be completed, continues to propel our thinking and not infrequently our art. Such propulsion is, of course, most visible in the ever-growing, always mutating, yet far from comprehensive and problematic Wikipedia, which I confess is where I found the lyrics to Lydia, the tattooed lady. <laughs> but how Wikipedia's encyclopedia diverges and converges from its Renaissance ancestors is a question for another evening. Thank you. My name is Thomas Van Slova, an Axel Springer Fellow and a guest of this academy, to which I am profoundly thankful for giving me the possibility to work here in Berlin. Um, I am, in my own opinion, I am a primarily a poet. Uh, separately, I am an essayist and a literary scholar and I uh, used to teach uh, Russian poetry over the 20th century, Pasternak, Tsvetaeva, Mandelstam, Bloch, and such things, also Brodsky, for many years. But uh, one of my mm, hobbies, I would say, and or to be more precise, one of the significant area of my interest was the history of my native country. And I mm, recently, I work on the uh, history of Vilnius, of the Lithuanian capital. I have published three books um, on that topic. 
uh, mainly of cultural history and on, on, on the general concept of the so-called city text. And um, now my, I'm in the beginning stages of writing uh, uh, an extensive history of Lithuania for the um, general audience as, as well for, um, for the academic audience. I'll talk mainly for general audience. So um, the, um, this country could uh, look mar just a marginal one, but I think it is not. There exists a tendency <coughs> to perceive um, the Baltic states um, as uh, um, certain unity, which is uh, definitely incorrect. Lithuania, the southernmost among the Baltic states, mm, differs from Latvia and Estonia since its uh, mm, cultural tradition is primarily Catholic and not Protestant, uh, which could be uh, considered a positive phenomenon or, 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 or negative phenomenon. In my opinion, it, it's, it's both. Uh, <laughs> then mm, Lithuania, mm, well, Latvia and Estonia gravitate towards German and Scandinavian uh, world. Lithuania is much more connected um, to the Slavic um, world, primarily to Poland, but also to Russia, willingly or unwillingly. It was uh, a strong and unique medieval state, the last pagan state in Europe, the country which joined um, the Western European uh, circle of nations uh, as the very last member of it. And mm, one should also note that the ancient Lithuanian Empire was not too much related to Lithuania of today. It was, uh, to a large degree, Slavic-speaking, uh, mm, while, the, uh, while mm, today's Lithuania is much smaller based on ethnic Lithuanian heritage and Baltic-speaking. There are very many mm, similarities between Lithuania and Ireland. Poland plays here, uh, Poland and partly Russia play here the role of England, by the way. Uh, both countries are Catholic. Uh, both countries uh, were, uh, and Lithuania still is, uh, not too prosperous. Uh, both have an immense and influential diaspora in the United States, and not only in the United States. And the, ga and the Gaelic um, national revival of the late 19th and early 20th, 20th century was uh, per perfectly parallel to the Lithuanian national revival. The same interest in, in the language, the same interest in mythology, the same literary movements, and so on and so on. When we read uh, Yeats or Joyce, we find something similar in our own tradition. As, as a rule, something similar in our own, own tradition. Although Lithuania was much more successful in uh, reviving the language than uh, than the Gaelic people. Uh, there are at, le at least three millions of native Lithuanian speakers, uh, the universities, the theaters, probably the best theaters in Europe, uh, extensive literature in Lithuanian language, extensive um, press, all the media, and so on and so on. But this uh, comparison is uh, one of the axis of my research. I am really interested in that, um, that profound similarity on two different edges of Western Europe. Lithuania at present is a country of uh, significant strategic importance, bordering on the one hand Belarus and on the other hand the so-called Kaliningrad region of Russia. It 
is and can be instrumental in conveying Western values and standards to Eastern Europe. And at the same time, it is mm, the unwilling, uh, an unwilling object of Russia's strategic advance. Uh, due to forced exile in the middle of the 20th century, um, history of Lithuania is to a very large degree history of Lithuanian diaspora, of diaspora intellectuals, primarily in, in the United States, which is also some of the focuses of, of my research. There are only um, several uh, histories of Lithuania available to uh, English or German or speaking uh, reader. Um, and most of them are biased. The biggest one and still unfinished is uh, 12 volume history of Lithuania, which is of course uh, the cutting edge uh, history, but unfortunately in Lithuanian language only. Uh, so uh, yes, as they say, non legunter uh, in uh, most countries. Uh, there is also a short history which uh, has an official uh, tinge on it. And, uh, in English and it's definitely very short. And uh, several emigre books which are def definitely biased. So uh, although uh, I don't uh, hope to, to finish my project here in Berlin, but I still uh, hope that uh, thanks to this uh, nice milieu, I will be able to make some uh, at least preliminaries, yes, yes at least preliminary work on it. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I'm Sian Fei, a John P. Berglund Fellow. First, I want to join everybody in thanking the Academy for bringing me here, especially the wonderful staff to make possible a transatlantic move of me and my family, including a rather incooperative baby. And a special thanks to Mr. Gasper. I just realized my husband and I met at Stanford under your presidency. Now here we are, everything makes okay. sense now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> everything makes sense now. So the subject of my project is about captivity, in particular, abduction across political borders. Hundreds of men and Chinese men and women taken from their home across, say, the Great Wall, overseas on pirate fleets, or into the mountain by in indigenous tribal men. In many ways, captivity is a universal phenomenon. We saw a lot in early American history, for example, and Ottoman Empire, of course, on some point was run by abducted soldiers. And uh, even today, we are not above human, global human trafficking, ISIS abducting gr young girls from villages in exchange for ransom. What intrigued me as a historian, however, is where and when such seemingly universal phenom phenomenon took place and how this particular context unveils for us insights into human life. So time and place. I have been working on 16th and 17th century China forever. The so-called Ming Dynasty, the second to the last dynasty in China, the reason I'm stuck there is there are a few strange things going on for that empire. To begin with, it was a time when the imperial power expanded enormously and was known as a dark age of despotism. But then it was also a time when the emperor in late 16th century got into a huge fight with his official and just about his choice of life, and then just went on a strike for three decades. He just didn't see anybody disappear from public view, and the country was just fine. Make one w wonder why we need em emperor to begin with. <laughs> and in fact, the country went underwent unprecedented prosperity. To add on that, it was also the empire built on the idea of villages. But then Christopher Columbus came along with all the silver mine from South America, and of course, all the silver went to China and never came back, just like the money did today, the influx of silver drove up prices, commerce, and created more cities than ever in Chinese history. The empire villages ended up facing one of the greatest wave of urbanization in China. How they managed it was the subject of my last book. In my, pro in my new project, I moved from core to periphery, where the Ming also proved an anomaly. The empire 
sandwiched between two grand empires, the Mongol, everybody knows Genghis Khan, the great immense Eurasian Empire, and the one after the Qing Empire, which doubled Chinese territory and really turned China to what we know today. So by the way, all the ethnic conflicts we read in the paper all came back to that 18th century expansion. The main sandwich in the, in the middle, however, instead of conquering and expanding, it was contrasting, losing grounds, people to its very innovative neighboring regimes. The Mongols, as fierce nomadic warrior as they were, were actually experimenting with settling down with settled economy, building cities, recruiting peasants and artisans from China, and pirates were building this international regime, floating regime on the sea, with Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, Spaniards working all together on the piracy fleets. The cross-border captivity in this particular context, in fact, turned out to be a form of recruitment and migration. In fact, cross-border captivity in 16th century Chinese borderland manifests itself in surprisingly diverse forms. It could be, just as we might have suspected, commercialized as human trafficking, but also interestingly, it could be a way to build networks. I once read about a daughter from a prominent gentry family got abducted by Paris, and soon they became very close allies because of this marriage alliance. And how to understand such smooth shift of loyalty and affiliation? It is indeed challenging from our present moment when identity politics dominates everything. But at a time long before the rise of imagined community, which is not just a political concept, but required particular technological development that was just not in China at the, at the time. Identity as we know today simply did not exist. It would be anachronistic to use that as an analytical term. And my working theory is that female chastity played a very big part of it, and I hope to tell you more by April, since we have endless time here in Berlin. And uh, I, I want to end on a personal note as someone from Taiwan, where like every w many parts in the world, where identity has become a source of so much hatred and violence, I find it li liberating to deliberate on alternative form of human and social existence. And I can only hope that history could provide some inspiration here. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Can everyone hear me? Uh, my name is Sanford Biggers, and um, as many of my colleagues, I'd like to extend uh, my appreciation for being invited and being one of the fellows chosen to be here this spring. Uh, and it's an incredible experience thus far. The staff, um, my colleagues, everyone here who we've come in contact with has been very generous, very helpful, um, very pleased to be here. This is actually my second time here. I came to visit a friend probably around six years ago when she was doing her fellowship. This was uh, Julie Meritu, one of the painters that was here a while back. And uh, several other friends of mine have come through these doors, so I feel like I'm once again in good historic company. Um, projects. I am going to talk about a project at some point. But before we get there, because I don't know what it is just yet, um, I'm going to give you a little perspective, which might help. Um, so I'm a visual artist. I consider myself an interdisciplinary artist. I work between painting, sound, installation, performance, and video. I've always worked that way. This is not a new thing. Um, if I could give you an analogy, we're in a room with several polyglots. Some things you could say better in German than you can say in English. Some things you could say better in French than you might be able to say in Russian. I find that I work creatively like that. Some things I might say better in a musical composition than I can say in a painting. And I choose my projects based on that. My perspective comes from the interesting dichotomy of being an American, but um, I obviously have a very precarious relationship with America. Anyone who watches the news from recently or let's say in any of our lifetimes can understand that. Um, my perspective is that at some point uh, when I was in university, I wound up in Florence, Italy studying Italian and studying art. And from that moment, I got the bug. And I basically, basically lived in several countries for probably around eight or nine years as part of my adult life. So my perspective is always being sort of in between places 
and even when I'm back at home feeling a bit in between. Um, so I found these creative means of discussing some of those interesting situations. Um, my work, although it works, you know, I work in multiple disciplines, the themes are always very consistent and they deal with history, art history, American history, world history, pop culture, humor, um, high culture, low culture, hip hop, Buddhism, spirituality, um, and aesthetics. Ultimately, it all ends in aesthetics. Um, I'm presently a professor at Columbia. Prior to that, I was teaching at Harvard and Cooper Union. So I'm very well versed in art history, but I actually have no interest in it right now because I'm interested in what happens next. Um, and this is the dichotomy, once again, of being an academic and a practitioner in contemporary art is where do the lessons stop and where does the pure creativity and improvisation begin? And I'm very fortunate to be here in a place where I have nothing but time. Um, and I plan to use that time to do exactly that, to expand and become a sponge, to absorb everything that I experience here with all these fine people and to find a way for that to incorporate in the many projects that I have once I'm back in the States or wherever I go from here. Um, so um, thank you for having me and enjoy. Hello. Um, a gentleman in the audience just before the event started said, um, now the fellows can have stage fright. So now I do, and thanks. <laughs> Just kidding, I always have stage fright, such that I might try to jump up like before it's my turn to talk. Um, the American Academy in Berlin have been so welcoming, and the conversations around the supper table and the food have been so good, I found myself wondering, you know, do people have a hard time leaving? <laughs> but I have a lot, uh, you know, months before I have to worry about that. My name is Tom Drury. I'm very honored to be the Mary Ellen Bonder Hayden Fellow. I write fiction. And specifically what I try to do is write novels set in our time while reading very old stories, mythology, epics. These are the things I like to read anyway. And my idea is not to borrow plot, but to take in language and narrative and see what happens. I find it's very unpredictable in a good way. For the novel I'm working on here, I've been reading different versions of the Faust legend. And the way I got into that might be kind of interesting. Um, one summer night, some friends took me to see an abandoned churchyard in Iowa, in the American Midwest, which is where I'm from. And the story associated with the churchyard was that a minister in the 19th century sold his soul to the devil for what we don't know. Anyway, as this happens, years pass, probably 24, the devil comes to collect, burns the church down, and takes the minister away on a horse. Now, did I believe it? No. I was there and I didn't believe it, but I found it interesting as the story had developed. The only bad thing that did happen to us there was that I got my rental car stuck in the mud uh, for a really long time. So we were kind of trying to you know, push it out um, while also nervously waiting for the ghosts to come out of the cemetery, but they never did, which was good. <laughs> and one other strange modern thing is that in this place, there was a sign nailed to a tree that said this area is under video surveillance. And I thought, wow, even here, <laughs> amazing. <coughs> anyway, it was after that that I began reading up on Faust, Marlowe's version, Goethe's, Master and Margarita, whatever I could find. And I got here two weeks ago and I thought, okay, now I'm ready to write. And I have begun. But at the same time, what is really cool is that I, as here in the academy and as I go around Berlin and I tell people about my project, They've been really great about suggesting actual places associated with the Faust myth that I could go. The Brocken, Stauffen, Leipzig. And I'm more than open to these suggestions. 
because I do want to let the project evolve in this new setting. I see that opportunity and I want to make use of it. And I'm very grateful to the American, American Academy for giving me the chance to do so. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Bruce Ackerman. Uh, I'm the Daimler Fellow uh, this uh, spring. Um, I will, this is the second time I've been in Berlin. Uh, I, I was a, a fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg uh, at a very different time in 1991, 92. Um, uh, and uh, succumbing to the triumphalist spirit of the moment, I uh, wrote a book called The Future of Liberal Revolution. Uh, and the, um, <coughs> the source of, the, the roots of, of my present project actually was an encounter with uh, the uh, a German publisher of the translation of the book, uh, uh, Ziedler, uh, who was a very impressive, scary guy. Um, and uh, he had read my book um, uh, in English and uh, um, said, uh, uh, Professor Ackerman, this is a really insightful book, but we have to make one change. Um, revolution doesn't sell in Deutschland. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, the... Uh, the uh, title of my book in, uh, in German is Ein Neuer Anfang für Europa. <laughs> it didn't sell. It didn't sell. But, but uh, it, I, listen, I, you know, I only work here. I mean, who am I to, I mean, Siedler, you know, Siedler selbst, you know, I mean, he's, he read it. I mean, how could I? But anyway, um, but this did get me uh, uh, thinking, uh, revolution doesn't sell in Deutschland. This is very true. Um, indeed, the um, uh, question uh, that I'm taking up at this very much darker moment uh, is the same one, uh, which is uh, um, uh, what are the paths of co to constitutionalism, to liberal democracy? Is there one path or more than one path? Um, is it really fundamentally important that, um, uh, let's say, uh, India, South Africa, uh, France and Italy after, uh, 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 during the resistance, <laughs> founded their constitutional orders on revolution, on the basis of revolutionary experiences, while Germany didn't. What are those different, I mean, are there systematic differences that follow from that? Um, well, that's the, in a word, the, uh, the uh, uh, question uh, 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 25 years after Ziedler's uh, sage remark um, that uh, I'm exploring uh, this time. And I'm really very uh, grateful uh, for, to the Daimler Foundation for giving me a second chance uh, to put uh, our uh, uh, you know, post-1989 predicament uh, <coughs> into a larger uh, uh, a framework of uh, understanding the uh, uh, various, but not too many. You see, I'm looking for, uh, I, my inspiration here is Max Weber. Uh, uh, I'm looking for a small number of <coughs> ideal types of constitutionalism, not a million different ones, or one, <laughs> but several, um, three in fact, uh, but for next week. You, you, I, I've been selected, never underestimate the letter a is a first name is the first letter of your last name as the first lecture and I'm going to give a lecture on three paths to constitutionalism next week uh, um, in the meantime as also I'm uh, engaged uh, for the last two decades in a second more contemporary project really uh, 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 as you may have noticed the uh, uh, progressive left has no ideas um, the ideas that have inspired the left today are those uh, that would have been familiar to Bismarck or, uh, or uh, uh, the Labor Party in 1945. Um, um, uh, and um, it has been my ongoing project uh, with collaborators who know more about particular things than I to write a series of books uh, which aim to uh, you know, confront the question, not that my answers are important in and of themselves, although they are, um, 
but uh, uh, to give examples, that is to say, uh, how, you know, what should the project, the actual program of progressive, um, uh, 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 democratic progressives in the West be that will generate commitment um, as opposed to technocratic manipulation of, uh, for prosperity. Um, uh, because if we don't, forget about my particular proposals, if we don't have a 21st century uh, program that normal human beings understand, uh, there will be no alternative to the uh, nationalist uh, uh, nuttiness that uh, uh, so easily can uh, uh, serve as a diagnosis uh, uh, of our present ills, which will not go away. Um, so this notion that we, uh, that the left has not recovered from the death of Marxism, which I do not mourn, I never have, have mourned, uh, but there's this great intellectual vacuum which we must fill uh, is uh, a second and abiding concern for me. Uh, I really do th uh, 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 look with, uh, 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 you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for getting a second chance. They're, they'd always tell me that, you know, there are no second chances, but the American Academy has, is providing me a second chance after the Wissenschaftskolleg, and I uh, thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Nathaniel Levto, and I'm the Anna Maria Kellen Fellow, and I'm an historian of religion. The modern study of religion in the Bible began in the Enlightenment and shone brightest in Germany. Reading the early modern and modern classics in the history and philosophy of religion led me to their historical and textual foundations in antiquity. If the past is a foreign country, I found the greatest adventures in the most distant and strange lands and in encounters with different minds. And this is where my project takes me. For my academy project, I'm writing about the destruction of writing, about the purposeful, physical violation of texts in antiquity, from the beginnings of writing to the formation of the Bible. More broadly, I'm writing a book about symbolic violence and about the power of textual and iconographic representation at the dawn of art and literacy. All kinds of texts, it seems, law codes, international treaties, magic spells and prophecies, inscribed statues, war memorials, were subjected in ancient times to all kinds of abuses, smashed, burned, erased, rewritten, abducted, placed in the paths of wild beasts, buried in the earth, sunk, drunk, eaten. Here I'll stop the list and invite you all to my talk at the end of March where we can think about other gastrointestinal literary possibilities. These violations reveal how the ancients interacted with inscribed objects as if they were magical or alive. I'm therefore investigating the relationship between a text's content, its physical form, its social location, its authorship, and its audience in a world that blended modern cognitive and social distinctions between mind and body, symbol and reference, the spiritual and the physical, and artifacts and living things. My book is also about the beginnings of book burning and about the, relation the relationship between violence against, against texts images, and human beings, and between religion, art, and writing. These are the ancient antecedents to modern acts of cross-cultural, symbolic, or religious violence, the historical and theoretical foundations of which remain under-examined. Now, perhaps the best way to summarize my project is simply to take my prepared statement and burn it or eat it, but I think Reinhold has prepared tastier hors d'oeuvres for us. So in order to get there more quickly, I just want to say now how deeply grateful I am to be here with a class of fellows who have already, after two short weeks, inspired me to modify my project in new and exciting ways. And of course, of course, so has being in Berlin. I want also to thank the remarkable staff of the American Academy for their warm welcome and hard work on our behalf. 
and the supporters of the American Academy for making all of this possible. Thank you. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, hello everybody. Before I present my work in a nutshell, I want to echo the heartfelt thank you of the fellows of the spring term to the American Academy. Without the work of the Board of Trustees, the counselors, the executive board members, and last but not least the staff, we all would not feel that we are in a kind of heaven of artists, writers, musicians, and of course also scholars. And it's not only a heaven, it's really an interdisciplinary and transatlantic heaven. And that's a very, very rare opportunity. And you know this if you were invited to other places. My fellowship is the German Transatlantic Program Prize, which I feel is extremely fitting. As some of you know, and some of you may even hear, I grew up in Hamburg, which is something which relates us and where I studied and worked until I moved to Berlin in 1987. And here I taught until 2002 at the TU Berlin at the History Department and the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies of Women and Gender, which I built up together with Karin Hausen. And after some nomadic years, which are quite typical for my generation of scholars in Germany, I finally settled as the James G. Cannon Distinguished Chair of History at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill 10 years ago. And today, I'm truly both. I'm an American citizen and I'm a German citizen. And I have a truly transatlantic identity. And not by accident, therefore, questions of political, social, and civil citizenship and questions of identity and memory next to the theme of gender and war are at the center of my work. I started as a social and women's historian and later moved to the fields of political, cultural, and military history. And my last project, which is hopefully coming out as a book next month, is titled Revisiting Prussia's Wars Against Napoleon, History, Culture, and Memory. I examine the construction of the memories of the Prussian and German struggle against Napoleon, which occupies a master place in the national historiography of Germany. I argue that we cannot achieve a comprehensive understanding of these wars and their importance in the collective recollection without recognizing how the interaction of politics, culture, and gender influenced the historical events and its recollection. I thus explore the highly contested discursive and symbolic practices by which individuals and groups in a highly contested manner tried to create interpretations recollections and identities starting in the period of the wars and ending in the centenary of 1930. So one kind of my head is still in this old project because the book is not out and I have to finish up work here. And I actually was invited originally to do this work here. But what I do now here and hear this encouragement to really enjoy the city and the space is very fitting. I really in the start of a very new project and this project has only a draft title, and it's Women's War and the Military in the Age of World War. And what I want to do is I explore the history and memory of the extensive mobilization of women for the, during the First and Second World War for the military. In this age of industrialized mass warfare, and I avoid the concept total war, there is a lot of discussion about this, and I'm not sure if we really get used to it. In any way, in this age of industrialized mass mobilization, all war powers increasingly use women for military purposes and also other kinds of war support on the home front, but also on the battlefield. During World War II, the number of women serving in the military as auxiliaries and nurses reached 100,000 in Britain, Germany, and the United States. Even larger numbers of women served in the Soviet army as soldiers and armed paramedics. And many more fought, fought as partisans in the armies which fought against occupying Germany. By looking at this phenomenon in a comparative perspective and in a dual way, in a 
temporal comparison and also in a regional comparison, I hope to explain the paradox that while women's military service was increasingly needed, it has long been downplayed in public perception, in historiography, and in memory, actually even forgotten in memory, in all war powers beyond the Iron Curtain in, in both post-war periods. And so I hope to explore this project further and hope to see some of you for the discussion of this project in April at Looking Up. Good evening, I'm Elliot Sharp. I'm the Ingemarin Otto Fellow in Music Composition and uh, very happy to be here, very grateful to the Academy and the trustees, everyone else who conspired to bring me here, along with my partner, video artist Janine Higgins, and Kai and Lila, our nine-year-old Spilling, who are, uh, shall we say, enthusiastic about attending school here, a very different experience than attending school in New York City, where we, where we live. I've been coming to Berlin since 1983. I've been here many, many times. I can't even count the number of times. Uh, mostly as a performer, often as a performer of my own music, from playing in the grungiest squats of Kreuzberg, Prewall, to the Philharmonie. And every time I come to Berlin, I'm always very happy to be here and always thinking about how I might spend more time here. And this fellowship has really given me the opportunity to spend uh, to, to really wallow in Berlin for a few months, which uh, we're very happy about. I'm going to be here working on a project called Substance. But first I want to talk a little bit about translation, not about languages, but the notion of the creative impulse. Over the years, more and more, I've begun to think about any creative act as an act of translation from something in the most abstract reaches of your inner mind, whether it's in the case of a composer, your inner ear, or just any uh, form of creative impulse that is not yet coalesced into a form that you can even define with words. And as a composer, very often I'm drawn to sound, but it may be some other realm. It may be sound I produce myself on an instrument. It may be sound that gets translated into a written score that is then played by other musicians. It may be translated to actions, which brings me to opera. The Over the last uh, 12 years, opera has been my main obsession, and I've written a few of them, and I'm here to begin work on Substance, which is an opera about Baruch Spinoza. It won't be a historical pageant. It will be a little more abstract than that. And Spinoza, I, I, I can't say I've chosen Spinoza, but he's someone whose thoughts and writing have been a major part of my thinking since I was first introduced to him at the age of 11 as a young science geek and inquiring agnostic and Hebrew school student where we were taught that here is the heretic. This is the person whose words are dangerous, whose words that we have to avoid and ignore because he is really defining everything that we're against. So well this sounds interesting and so I began to explore Spinoza's thoughts and philosophies and really found over the years that more and more I read him and read interpretations of his thoughts as a key figure in the Enlightenment, as a key figure transitioning Western civilization from an age of myth and uh, we could call it religion, myth, into an age of interpretation of objective reality and how that brings us to a uh, more, let's say, realistic observation and actions in the modern world. And I hope to capture some aspect of his thinking in this work. Spinoza's vocation as a lens maker is becoming central as I begin to conceive of this opera, the notion of looking at the world both microscopically and macroscopically through a very physical object that has very definable properties. And I hope to incorporate this, whether as fact or as metaphor, into this opera. And it's just in the beginning stages, and as it proceeds, it will become manifest, and I hope you will all be here to uh, hear about it. Thank you so much.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Evgeny Marozov. I'm the Bosch Fellow in Public Policy. I'm very happy to be at the American Academy in Berlin, um, not just because uh, we are really been taking excellent care of, but also because Berlin is really uh, probably the best place to be for the kind of work that I do, which lies at the intersection of uh, technology and politics. Uh, and as you probably all know, Berlin really is the place right now where the subject um, is uh, discussed very widely, and not just because of the uh, issues that have to do with privacy and surveillance, to which Germany has um, a very uh, strong sensitivity to, but also because of the questions that are increasingly asked about the power of um, various big technology companies in Silicon Valley and how they're shaping the landscape uh, for competition, but also for citizenship uh, in uh, Germany and Europe as a whole. Um, as you can hear from my accent, uh, actually I come from Belarus and my work on technology and politics began with me exploring the impact that various new media were having on uh, authoritarian regimes. I spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe, but also some time in the Middle East and elsewhere, trying to understand the ways in which those various social movements and activists are taking advantage of blogs and social networks and various digital platforms, but also the ways in which the same very tools were of great help to authoritarian governments. And uh, some of my early work uh, focused on understanding how is it that we come to have so much faith and so much um, belief in the power of this, not just technologies, but actual technology companies to bring freedom and democracy to places where um, it hasn't uh, been um, <coughs> before, right? And, and the questions that I began asking back then was the extent to which we tend to over-rely on uh, these companies as providers of solutions that perhaps ought to be tackled at a somewhat different political and social level. You cannot replace foreign policy with just a bunch of apps, uh, as I discovered in my early work. Then I moved on to understanding the ways in which some of the same enthusiasm I saw in the uh, foreign policy circles, how it spread to many other fields where the spirit of disruption uh, has been uh, noticed in fields as education and health and um, transportation, those of you who pay attention to Uber would certainly know about this, uh, almost every field this day seems uh, ripe for disruption, and along with the technological disruption, there also comes economic and social disruption, right? And to understand both the causes and the consequences of this, but also to understand the enthusiasm that we attach to uh, many of these companies and many of the apps uh, was something that I uh, tried to understand. My work right now and what I want to focus specifically at the academy is the ways in which the proliferation of sensors and proliferation of connectivity into virtually all the smart objects that we currently have in our households, in our cities, is transforming how we live and how we govern. Uh, the proverbial example that many people use and uh, have been using probably for many decades when they talk about something like the Internet of Things is this uh, future where your fridge will finally be able to talk to your supermarket and order milk as you're running low on milk or as your garbage can will figure out that you're running low on napkins because of the tax that you have thrown far too many into your, nap into your uh, garbage can. Uh, those examples, I think, overstate uh, both the uh, speed with which many of these technologies are developing, but also the resistance that's going to come from the, uh, from the citizens and the consumers. On the other hand, uh, I think the future that we are facing will be probably a little bit scarier, but also a little bit more banal. The one example that I will give you that is actually already happening, and it's not the, the work of science fiction, is an example that I saw uh, discussed by um, uh, a lot of scholars who, who studied these technologies in Southeast Asia. So if you've recently been to the Philippines, and if you've had a chance to visit a public bathroom there, you might have noticed something odd happening. So once you leave the stall, uh, an alarm goes off. And the only way to turn it off is to push the soap dispenser button. And thus wash your hands uh, and exit the bathroom with your hands clean. 
Um, that, I would argue, is a somewhat trivial example, but here you can clearly see how the proliferation of sensors and how the ability to detect and understand our behavior can be easily interlinked with all sorts of social and political and economic paradigms that are not at all technological in nature. So trying to understand the ways in which the fact that our environment is now wired and censored and smart opens up new ways uh, for political and social transformation is something that I'm very interested in. And I would just like to stress that there needs to be no need for us to be technophobic. There are many ways in which uh, sensors uh, of this sort can actually be used for social good. They can be used for projects that are not just about making us buy more or making us do things that we would rather not do on our own. Uh, the key question, however, and this is something that I will be exploring uh, in my time here, is who owns the data, right? Who owns the sensors? Who owns the data that we generate as we walk down the street and our phone pings our location to the smart bus or smart city that we are going to interact with? Will we be able to take that data and arrange a new, different model of public transportation that will not be like Uber, but will nonetheless allow us to plan a trip uh, together? If, for example, through our smartphones, now we can find out that 10 people in our neighborhood are going in the same direction, right? H to know that, however, you know, it's very easy to book that service and organize a bus. But to know that, however, you need to ask key questions. Will we be able to share that data? Who will be able to access it? How would we be able to organize a service in a way that that data will not just stay with the uh, company operating your mobile phone or company operating the smart city? And at this point, the smart city project, for example, is predominantly corporate, right? The citizens uh, or activists or social groups are not uh, well represented in it. So uh, the questions that I'm going to be uh, asking uh, in my time here mostly do revolve with alternative deployments of such technologies, but also with alternative means of data ownership finding out ways in which uh, we can actually uh, unleash the potential of any of these technologies rather than just uh, hearing them and running away from them. So on this, I think I would end, and I hope uh, we will uh, continue conversing, particularly at my lecture, which is coming up. It's in two weeks. Thank you. <laughs> We're almost there. We're almost there. Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All of the thank yous, I endorse them. Euro. Thank you, and Euro, thank you. Thank you for welcoming. Um, uh, what I want to do tonight is um, spend the next uh, six hours tracing the history of American foreign policy in the Middle East from 1945 till present. Um, that's what I want to do, but I'm not going to do that. Um, you have to wait for a very exciting six-hour lecture coming up in March. Um, what I'll do instead is just give you a sort of three-minute overview of what I'm uh, thinking about in the book that I'm, that I'm working on. Um, let me take you back six years, I think it is by now, um, to Afghanistan. Uh, I'm interviewing uh, a leader of the Taliban who had just come out of uh, American prison at Bagram. Um, he is a guy I met in the 90s, one of the smartest leaders of the the Taliban, and in fact, he, uh, if the Taliban had a think tank, he probably would head it. Uh, Gary, by the way, that's not a bad, if you're looking for future challenges, <laughs> the fundraising challenges are severe. Um, <laughs> but I can see various partnerships building. The, um, so I'm, I'm, ta I'm interviewing him, and I ask him a question that I ask um, a lot of uh, people in that part of the world. Uh, I said, do, do you think that um, the U.S. can defeat you? And uh, to my surprise, he said, yes. It's not the usual answer. And I said, uh, how, uh, how would that work? And he said, um, every spring for the next 100 years, you have to fight us, and eventually we'll get tired. And, of course, I looked at him and said, uh, you know, we're not, the United States of America is not fighting anyone for 100 years. And he looked at me and smiled and said, yes, I know. Um, <laughs> The, um, uh, on one level, the, the book that I'm working on that will come out with God's help in the late 2016 um, is going to be an analysis of the, the foreign policies of George W. Bush and Barack Obama as they relate to the area that stretches from Morocco and Tunisia in the west to uh, Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan in the east. Um, 
on a deeper level, I'm trying to look at the question of why we, the United States, has such a difficult time managing our relations in the, in the broader Middle East. And in the, uh, in the 47 seconds I have left, let me give you uh, three ideas that I'm playing with, three impediments, three, three reasons that, we seem that, that explain in part why we seem to be defeated over and over and over uh, again. Um, one refers to this uh, story about the, the Afghan, uh, our, our immense strategic uh, impatience. In, in the part of the world that I'm describing, the, um, the, the shortest unit of measurable time is the decade. Um, in the United States, the, the, it seems sometimes that the longest measurable unit of time is the four-year presidential term. Um, so we see, we, if you look back over the last 14 years in American foreign policy, it seems schizophrenic in, in many ways. And that's an, that, that is due in part to our lack of strategic patience. Um, the second area that I'm looking at is our uh, civic religion, which uh, for shorthand you could call it solutionism, the American belief that every problem comes with a solution. It's one of the reasons the United States is, to my mind, the greatest country in the history of the world. It's one of the reasons that the United States constantly gets into trouble. Um, uh, because we always believe, we look at a problem and we think there has to be an answer to that. Which leads me to the third area that I'm exploring, which is the role of magical thinking, or if you want to be a little bit more respectful, wishful thinking in the formulation of foreign policy. Obviously, in the Bush years, uh, we see uh, a, a belief that if you remove the boot, Saddam Hussein's boot, from the neck of the Iraqi people, the Iraqi people will rise up and quickly evolve into a representative democracy in the style of a Vermont town meeting. Um, <laughs> that was born of a belief that we can fix this. Uh, and it was born of impatience, and it was born of uh, a, 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 a desire to, uh, when, when the facts are too difficult to deal with, giving yourself over to some kind of magic thinking. In the Obama administration, I would say that there is a, another form of magical thinking or wishful thinking, which is that you can leave the Middle East, you can leave the greater Middle East without consequence. Um, I have come to the provisional conclusion, and I'm going to test these theories out in the months and year or so ahead, that um, if, the, uh, if the Bush administration foreign policy stands as a testament to the perils of overreaction, then the Obama administration foreign policy, particularly in this region, may just stand as a testament to the perils of underreaction. And anyway, my six-hour lecture is coming up later in this year, and I hope to see all of you there. Thank you very much. We are almost there. Uh, there are two fellows who could not be with us here tonight. Um, Mary Jo Bang is the Ellen Maria Gorison Fellow. She's a poet and professor of English at Washington University. And her project is the Bauhaus, A Study in Balance, a book of poems. And two of her poems are printed on your, on your program t this evening. And Sean Willens is the Siemens Fellow, and he is a professor of American history at Princeton. And his project is The Politics of American Anti-Slavery. Both of them will be joining us later in this semester. Now, we are over. The formal part of this evening is over, so please join us in the other room for a reception and to meet these terrific people that you've heard from tonight. So thank you for coming. Thank you.